Charles Eastman graduated from Boston University's School of Medicine. It was 1890, and he was one of the first indigenous people in the United States to earn a medical degree. We learned about Dr. Eastman through one of his descendants. My name is Victor Anthony Lopez Carmen. My Dakota name is Waukiamani, and my Yaki name is Machil. Victor's a member of the Yaki tribe and the Crow Creek Sioux Nation. He traces his lineage back to Dr. Eastman through his Sioux ancestry. In the Dakota language used by the Sioux, Eastman's name was Ohiesa, which means like always victorious or the winner. While Eastman was in school in Boston, conflict raged on the plains. Our people were still at war with the U.S. After Eastman graduated from medical school, he moved to the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. There, he treated his people, the Sioux, including the Lakota and Dakota. Not long after, in December 1890, the U.S. Cavalry fired on hundreds of Lakota men, women, and children. It became known as the Massacre at Wounded Knee. The Bureau of Indian Affairs estimates at least 250 were killed. The attack took place less than 20 miles from where Eastman worked. Eastman wrote about his experience caring for the wounded in his autobiography, called From the Woods to Civilization. The book is one of the ways Victor has come to know his ancestors' story. And so the survivors were rolling into the military camp at Pine Ridge. And so he was helping treating these survivors uh, at the military base. Uh, and he was speaking to them in their language. And, you know, I could imagine how heartbreaking it was for him as a physician to ride out and, and help bring back the survivors to the base. What do you think that was like for the survivors to be tended to by a Native physician? I feel like... I feel like it was everything. I mean, you know, you just saw your whole family get murdered in front of you and you're scared and you don't trust the military doctors. And there's a Dakota physician, which they've never had before, who speaks their language. In that moment, I feel like that is everything. And it is uh, an example, although, you know, a more extreme example of why we do need Native physicians, where an Indigenous physician coming in from that community, from that tribe, I think could do so much good, you know, just like Dr. Charles Eastman did. Today, Victor is in his third year at Harvard Medical School, on the road to becoming a physician himself. 130 years after Eastman got his medical degree, Victor started medical school as one of only two Native students. So for me, there's only one more native in my class than my ancestor had uh, over a hundred years ago. And that's not much progress. Less than 1% of medical students in the United States identify as American Indian or Alaska native. The representation is just as low for doctors. Of the more than 700,000 active physicians in the United States, only 0.5% identify as American Indian or Alaska native. Those numbers come from a 2018 report from the Association of American Medical Colleges and the Association of American Indian Physicians. The number of full-time medical school faculty who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native is even lower, just 0.4%. What do you think he would have thought about the lack of progress since his time, that there's still this disparity? I think he would have been frustrated. He would be rightfully angry. The lack of indigenous physicians has implications for health. Studies do show that, number one, we're the most likely to return to our communities to practice. And number two, that practice is usually more effective because we know the culture. In this episode, we're going to hear some of the reasons behind the push to train more indigenous healthcare workers and improve cultural competency. We'll see how the lack of Indigenous physicians exacerbates health disparities in Indigenous communities and what people like Victor and others are doing to get more Indigenous people into medicine. We'll hear about some of the factors keeping these students out of medical school. We're weaning down significantly by not having our students start high at the beginning of this uh, pathway, you know, the K through 12. What awaits these students when they do make it to med school? I did feel alone. There wasn't any Native person around me I could turn to. And how one tribal medical school is changing that experience. 
feeling like you belong in that community is actually starting to show really makes a big impact on student success and prevention of burnout. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder, and this is American Diagnosis. Victor Lopez Carmen grew up in Tucson, Arizona, near one of his tribes, the Yaqui. Back then, money was tight. I mean, our, our electricity and stuff was getting shut off all the time. There were times where um, we were about to be homeless. Gangs were active in Victor's school. He remembers there being a lot of pressure to join one. It seemed cool at the time, and it was a very tricky balance to, to stay away from that. And I had one teacher who really changed my life. He invited Victor to join an after-school science club. It really captivated my mind, and I feel like it really helped me to be able to, to transcend all the, the hurdles around me. At the same time, I, I look back, and since I've been on that path, and I know a lot of the barriers that prevent Native kids from getting to the place where they need to be. Dr. Mary Owen has also been thinking about the barriers Indigenous students face. She says it starts with high school graduation. We're weaning down significantly by not having our students start high at the beginning of this uh, pathway, you know, the K through 12. Mary's the president of the Association of American Indian Physicians. I said my Tlingit name is Gludash. I'm named after my grandmother. I'm from the Thunderbird House of the Shark Clan of the Aquan tribe of the Tlingit people from Southeast Alaska. Mary's also the director of the Center of American Indian Minority Health at the University of Minnesota. Mary says where she lives in Duluth, high school graduation rates for Native students can be low. So if we are recruiting and trying to get um, fill the vacancy needs for the Bemidji area, which I live in, or the Northern Plains, where are those students going to come from who are likely to stay here and serve? They're going to come from these schools where we don't have high graduation rates. When we were talking, Mary played out a dismal hypothetical scenario. Imagine a school with 2,000 Indigenous students, but only half graduate. It might be down to <clears throat> less than 1,000, right? And if 25% of those students go on to college, then maybe you've got 250. Of those, maybe a quarter go into STEM and are successful. So maybe 125, right? She says the young people who go into medicine would be even fewer. At this point, she says, maybe there's only 75 students from that hypothetical class of 2,000 who have the education to get into medical school. But in actuality, when you get, when you talk about getting entry into those schools, the numbers are far less. The students can't meet the GPA standards, they can't meet the MCAT standards. When Victor Lopez Carmen was an undergrad, he had support many don't. At Ithaca College, he heard about a program for Indigenous students interested in medicine. Students would do a summer of research at Harvard Med School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. It was called Four Directions. So I went there, I'm I'm landing in Boston, and it was really the first time that I was surrounded by Native people who wanted to go into medicine. Before Four Directions, Victor says he was often the only Indigenous student in his science courses. And then when I met the founder of that, the person who created that program, Dr. Tom Sequest, I was like, wow, like, I was so mind blown. He was the first Native physician that I ever met. And it made me feel like I could do it too. Victor started at Harvard Medical School in 2019. After he arrived, though, he was troubled by some of the conversations he had about Indigenous people and their health. One of the first things that people talk about is always, well, alcoholism. According to the Indian Health Service, American Indians and Alaska Natives are significantly more likely to report alcohol and substance use disorders than any other race in the U.S. Victor doesn't dispute that substance use is a challenge, but what he doesn't like is how stats like this are presented, just the numbers, with no conversation about why they are the way they are. And what I believe is hurtful is that the context is often left out. The context of why. Why do we have the alcoholism? Because that context leaves room for us to say that is not inherent to us. And when you really dig deep into it, you realize alcoholism is a symptom of the trauma that we have faced. 
Mary Owen, president of the Association of American Indian Physicians, agrees. That's my biggest beef with our curriculum right now, is stop talking about all these things without talking about the way that our society is impacting populations and keeping them from good health. That if we only will stop eating the bad foods, if we'll only stop smoking, if we'll only stop drinking, if we'll only behave ourselves, then we'll have better health outcomes. Mary says these are symptoms of problems that are bigger than any one person. People are suffering from all these factors like unemployment, lower education achievement, homelessness, or inadequate housing. All these factors are getting in the way of their ability to engage in positive health behaviors. That includes federal policies. A lot of health issues that Native people and Indigenous peoples have do relate back to underfunding from the U.S. government or policies that are still hurting our people. Dr. Charles Eastman wrote about facing similar issues in his autobiography when he was working at the Pine Ridge Reservation over 100 years ago. He knew that the funding that was coming in for health care was actually lower than, than it was originally agreed upon in treaties and agreements between the tribal leaders and the U.S. government. And he began pushing. Uh, he went to his higher officers saying, hey, This isn't right. Like, we were promised way more than this. And he began advocating, and and he was fired for that. They let him go because he was pushing for more funding. Today, Oglala County, South Dakota, which overlaps with the Pine Ridge Reservation, has one of the lowest life expectancies in the United States. Dr. Eastman wrote in his autobiography about the challenges of being the only Native person in a medical school. Victor says it can still be difficult today. Insensitive or thoughtless comments, microaggressions, have made him feel like he doesn't belong. One day, he was in the hospital doing a rotation with a group of medical students, physicians, and nurses. Outside one of the patient rooms, someone made a joke. He said that uh, we should do a Native American rain dance around the patient. And everyone started laughing, the whole team. And I didn't laugh. Uh, And I just shook my head. And it really hit me deep. Uh, I don't know if it was because he knew I was Native or not. And we didn't know if the patient was Native either. But knowing the sacrifices that my people had to go through to protect our ceremonies and knowing how important they are to us, and to have that be made fun of in patient care was really jarring for me. Victor spoke up and challenged the man who made the comment. He said he was offended by the joke. Uh, We had, you know, a nice conversation. I thought it was fine. Uh, And then I noticed that things got weird. And I felt like when I brought it up, I was sort of ostracized from the team. I was getting less opportunities. Victor filed a complaint with the medical school about the joke and the way he was treated afterwards. He says one result was that the medical school implemented indigenous-specific training for staff. But the exchange left Victor in an uncomfortable position. One microaggression can really make an impact because it is difficult for us to bring them up. Unfortunately, I feel like it can change team dynamics in a way that falls against you. So what would it look like to learn to be a doctor in a place where you're surrounded by other Native students? Coming up after the break, we'll hear what it's like to go to a tribally affiliated medical school. Ashton Gatewood is a third year student at the Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine at the Cherokee Nation. And to introduce myself in Choctaw, which is one of my tribes, I would say, Halito Chimichukma Su Hochiftu Ashton Choctaw Sai. And that just says, Hello, my name is Ashton. How are you today? I'm Choctaw. She's also a descendant of the Chickasaw Nation. Ashton grew up outside Oklahoma City in a town called Mustang. As a kid, she was fascinated with caring for animals and plants. One time my parents took us to get uh, plants for the garden and there was like a broken plant. And my parents were like, no, you can't have that one. Pick one that's not broken. And I just like wanted this broken plant because I wanted to take it home and fix it. Ashton thought about being a veterinarian, but in the end, she decided to become a doctor. Then she was accepted at the University of Missouri School of Medicine. I just remember the day I found out every single person I saw that day, 
I was just like, I'm going to be a doctor. And then it didn't matter what we were meeting for or what the conversation was. Um, I think I probably told like 100 people that day. When Ashton arrived in Columbia, Missouri, she was excited. But it was a big change. She'd never been so far away from family. I think what was really hard for me was my first test block. Um, We took a nine-hour, 200-question Scantron test, and it was a very difficult, very draining week. And I couldn't just... um, go home or um, have family to go like get lunch and talk with. It was really stressful. Ashton says moments like this were when she started to feel alone as an Indigenous student. Medical school in Missouri was starkly different from her experience as an undergrad. At Oklahoma City University, we had the American Indian Society. My sister was an American Indian Society scholar. I was Miss Indian OCU. So there wasn't that kind of home base. Ashton got a scholarship from the Indian Health Service when she was at the University of Missouri. Her plan was to return to Oklahoma and treat indigenous patients, but she didn't see her people in the coursework. Occasionally we would talk about the black community and we would talk about how these patients might have higher rates of heart disease or diabetes. Um, But I remember during the diabetes lecture, I was sitting there and thinking American Indians have the highest rate of diabetes. The black community also has, a, but it, American Indians have the highest rate. So it was just, um, I just felt like I wasn't getting the information that I would need to go back and, and serve my community. The homesickness, lack of social support, and doubts about how well she would be prepared to serve her community started to pile up. After her second year, Ashton withdrew from the program. Ashton left medical school and moved back to Oklahoma. She became a nurse and started working at the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. Later, she also got a master's in public health. But she never stopped thinking about becoming a physician. It was always kind of there. I was always kind of thinking about it. And I, I heard about Cherokee Nation partnering with Oklahoma State to make the first tribally affiliated medical school. So I told my husband about it, and, and he said, that sounds like they're building you a medical school. You have to go. In 2020, the Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine at the Cherokee Nation opened in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. Ashton was in the first class of future physicians. From the start, she says it was a very different experience. I've been in classes with other Native students, but to have this many people, um, you know, from my tribe, that's a whole different, you know, thing I haven't really gotten to experience before. Remember when we said at the top that less than 1% of medical students in the United States are indigenous? At Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine at Cherokee Nation, nearly one in four students identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. Another big difference is the number of indigenous faculty at the school. We have such a large number. Dr. Nolan, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Beck, Dr. Janelle Johnson, she's a family medicine um, Cherokee physician. Dr. Johnson was the first faculty who wore traditional clothes or beadwork and spoke Cherokee with us. She's also um, printed around this school skeletons where she's like labeled the body parts in Cherokee and English. Ashton's on the tribal medical track. It's a focus on primary care for indigenous people in Oklahoma. So we do a lot of our electives and our core clinical rotations at tribal hospitals and tribal clinics. The coordinator of the program, Zan Bryant, gave all the women she advises a set of earrings. They're orange, black, and white, the school's colors. The pattern is inspired by Cherokee regalia dresses. So um, we all wear them to um, business dress-up kind of events. And so it's really cool to be able to look up across the room and see the other students that are on the tribal medical track wearing their beadwork. Ashton is studying how this sense of belonging affects Indigenous students' success in school. Students have said things like, It's brought them culturally closer to their community, that it's inspired them to come back and work in their community. And students have even said that they don't think they could have been as academically successful as they have been if they were not at this type of program. The College of Osteopathic Medicine at the Cherokee Nation has been open two years. It's still too early to know how many of its graduates will go on to serve Indigenous communities, but Ashton is encouraged. Before the College of Osteopathic Medicine opened, Oklahoma State already had a program focused on placing physicians in tribal and rural communities. More than half of those graduates, 25, are currently working for the Cherokee, Choctaw, or Chickasaw nations. I think that if we can kind of continue the momentum we have, 
we might actually be able to solve some of the issues we see with the gaps in our healthcare provider shortage areas and our lack of Native physicians. When Ashton graduates, she says she wants to return to the Urban Indian Clinic in Oklahoma City, where she first worked as a nurse. Working there, she saw firsthand how important it can be to have Indigenous health care staff. She remembers, one day, a Muscogee family brought in their child for an appointment with a dietitian. The staff noticed the child had marks on their arm that looked like light scratches. And one of the dietitians was concerned, is this child abuse? Like, what do I do? So um, the dietitian called me and I was um, her supervisor at the time and asked me, and um, this family was not my tribe. Ashton called another nurse who was Muskogee. She explained that the marks were part of a healing ceremony. The family finished their appointment with a dietitian and got advice on how to make sure the scratches didn't get infected. And I think, you know, if that family had gone to a non-tribal clinic and seen a non-tribal provider, That could have come around into like a child abuse report. It could have triggered a whole chain of adverse experiences that could have had long-term impacts as far as influencing when and how that family accessed health care. Victor Lopez Carmen, the Yaki Crow Creek Sioux medical student at Harvard, has met many indigenous doctors over the years, but he's never been treated by one. A while back, he was at an IHS clinic getting an x-ray. The technician was Lakota, one of the Sioux tribes. And as he was taking my my films, uh, in between he would speak Lakota to me and teach me things in Lakota and, and be like, you know, we're so proud of you. Like, Keep doing what you're doing and just talking to me about our culture. And I had never experienced that before while I was getting an x-ray. Like, I feel like it made a big difference for me. Victor wants to be that welcoming presence for his own patients one day. Having a Lakota x-ray technician be able to just talk to them doing all that, I think, you know, could tangibly make a big difference knowing that that he is there. And every time there's a that I have a first in medicine with a native provider, I do feel really inspired and really good. When Victor graduates, he wants to go into pediatrics and work with both his tribes, the Yaki in Arizona and the Crow Creek Sioux in South Dakota. I have big goals for what I want to do at the community level. Things like improving trust, exploring new ways to deliver health care, and helping people access traditional foods. Victor has also been working to create more pathways for Indigenous students to get into medical school. He wanted to create something in honor of his ancestor, Dr. Charles Eastman. Eastman's Dakota name was Ohiesa. I created the Ohiesa pre-medical program. It brings in eight Native American pre-med students, but specifically coming from tribal colleges and community colleges for a summer program and then year-long mentorship. In a world where indigenous physicians are too rare, Victor found himself looking to figures in the past for guidance. People like his ancestor, Dr. Charles Eastman. I just get emotional like thinking about that because I feel like he has been my mentor. And a lot of people who aren't alive have been my mentor. Like my ancestors, reading and hearing their stories, I feel like has provided me a lot of mentoring that I can't get in the medical field today because there aren't that many native physicians. I think he would be really proud. I think he would be really happy and We'd probably be working together on many different things. This episode was corrected on July 27, 2022, to accurately characterize the academic milestone that Dr. Charles Eastman achieved. We regret the error. This season of American Diagnosis is a co-production of Kaiser Health News and Just Human Productions. Additional support provided by the Burroughs Welcome Fund and Open Society Foundations. This episode of American Diagnosis was produced by Zach Dyer and me. It was engineered by Jim Briggs. Special thanks to Alec Kalak, Dr. Natasha Bray, and Diane Weber. Our editorial advisory board includes Jordan Bennett Begay, Alistair Bitsoy, and Brian Pollard. Tanya English is our managing editor. Una Tempest does original illustrations for each of our episodes. 
Our theme music is by Alan Vest. Additional music from the Blue Dot Sessions. We're powered and distributed by Simplecast. If you enjoy the show, please tell a friend about it today. And if you haven't already done so, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. Follow Just Human Productions on Twitter and Instagram to learn more about the characters and big ideas you hear on the podcast. And follow Kaiser Health News on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Subscribe to our newsletters at khn.org so you never miss what's new and important in American health care, health policy, and public health news. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. Thanks for listening to American Diagnosis.